welcome to another episode of the Carmudgeon Show. We're just Derek today and Jason's office at the plant, actually. Uh, but I guess this is a Jason-free mm. week. Ooh, or... Jason is coming. I feel that Jason is joining. Okay. Feel a song coming on. You ready for this? Born ready. Okay. If you could read my mind, love, what a tale my thoughts would tell. Ooh, I would look into my crystal ball. And <laughs> God, I just got a glimpse of myself in the camera. What an idiot. <laughs> It's literally a bowl of 190E. You're having a bowl of 190E. It is not. It is not a bowl. It's a crystal ball. Can't you tell? And it's definitely not on a, you know, clipboard because we have prop money here and the shit. What is on your head? I'm a fortune. It fell. Hold on. It was supposed to be like, you know, I don't have like an outfit department in my house, like a costume and hair and makeup. It was supposed to look like this. And I was supposed to be like... I see a classic car in your future. And I think it just fell when I was off. Anyway, listen. You, th- this is all your fault. Hold on. What the hell happened to your kitchen? I'm not in my kitchen. Why do you I'm have not a in my poster house. growing out of your head? I'm not in my house at all. I'm actually, uh, I'm in Washington visiting my brother for the 4th of July. Oh, look at you being all like pre-corona. Sorry, I'm still jumping, I'm clearing towels off the floor. Uh, look at you being all like pre-COVID, like I'm going to travel. I drove here in one day. It was 14 hours of misery on I-5. It's actually not that miserable. It's just a lot of hours to be in the car. What 800, car were you in? 895 miles. I did not use one of my own cars because I did not trust it to survive 2,500 miles of road tripping. <laughs> <laughs> the sign of a true enthusiast. I can't oh, drive I to, one of my 20 cars. I have to go cars. someplace. I'd better, I'd better rent something. So I have a Passat, which is actually reasonably tolerable. It's actually quite good. I'm pleased with it. But I'm easily impressed. We've talked about this. It has air conditioning that functions, so that functions, I like yeah. it. And uh, do you get... So let me see. Passat. Okay, best part about Passat, I'm moving screens around, I apologize. Best part about Passat is the offset driving position. Oh, I wish I had a steering wheel. So here's the steering wheel, and you're sitting like this in a Passat. Have you noticed that? Yeah, it's a little bit, I mean, I don't know. I, Halfway I was, over to the passenger seat. I was ready to be done with it after 14 hours in the car. Hmm. But okay. even so. So anyway, yes, I'm in, in Washington, and it's not raining right now, actually. Yeah, it almost looks sunny. Almost. There's light coming in. Okay. Um, And uh, I am at home with my crystal ball thing. And this is all your fault because earlier today we were, you know, you emailed me, your text messaged me this morning. I was sleeping at like, you know, 830 because I had a long, crazy, drawn out 4th of July holiday weekend where I did absolutely nothing. Um, Thank you, 2020. Um, And you said, let's talk about what makes a classic car. And I'm like, my immediate reaction is, if I knew that, like, you mean, if, well, that's not, well, this is I mean, me being a sarcastic shit to you, right? I mean, like my immediate reaction is, it's not if what there was a guarantee. It, it's, it's how do you identify what's going to become a classic is the question I was actually trying to ask. Well, you can't. If you did that, I would be like, okay, well, I'm just going to buy this, this, and this, and this, and that's my retirement plan because they are going to become classics and therefore I will be able to retire. Rich. I mean, and that is... Definitely That's kind of, them. people ask me that question often yeah. uh, with regularity, and I, I have thoughts on the subject. I mean, you might have thoughts on the subject too, or you just are, you buy, I don't know, if, it depends on whether you're buying on that basis or not. Everybody is, uh, or for a 10-year period that was, has certainly ended at least five years ago, cars were one of the highest performing uh, hard asset classes, like mm-hmm. better than precious metals and real estate and so people were jumping on the bandwagon trying to invest in cars and people will ask ask me often you know should i buy this or that and and what's a better investment uh and typically i my response will be to say that i don't think you should invest in cars i mean it'll be nice if you can buy something that's not depreciating but by the time you maintain it properly uh 
I don't know if you'll get enough joy out of it to, to justify the cost if you're only looking at it from an, an investment standpoint because it's not they're not guaranteed to perform. However, there are certainly cars that go up in value over time or have gone up in value in, over time. Uh, and uh, you seem to have bought some of those. I mean, yeah, I, I am... I think my cars have done pretty well, but there's also a time component and a maintenance component. We've discussed this before. I value my time at zero. So I have a spreadsheet for every one of the cars. I value your time at zero also. It's so nice to be loved. Um, what? It's my, I, I make fun of you like 4% as much as you make fun of me. I know, but it's not like it's not funny when you do it because it comes across as serious and then my feelings get hurt. Wait. I don't have feelings. Fuck you. Anyway, no. no it, uh, it's not I, funny done, to you. <laughs> that's probably true. I, no, I've done okay on cars. Look, I've certainly lost money on cars. I mean, my 996 was, like, as far as I was concerned, the most... It was, like, did the you best like possible. that car? I did like that car. I like that car a lot, actually. Um, but I didn't... I went into it. So I, I sort of make every decision with a with a planned amount of cost involved, right? So I, I, try to, I try to look at buying any car with an eyes wide open situation. Like this is what it's gonna cost to purchase. This is what I expect it to be worth in X amount of time. Um, and this is what I think you know, is reasonable to expect in terms of maintenance cost and, and upkeep. Um, and then typically I'm, I'm basing that on science, right? I'm basing that on spreadsheets and nerdiness. And I'm sometimes okay and sometimes not. My 996 purchase, well, this was in 2000. Five, two thousand five, and I was looking at nine nine three prices, and they mm, just not they, an apples to apples comparison. I, did I realize this at that okay. point? There had been no nine eleven that didn't stop have like some hard wow. My whole fucking house just shook when I did that. Um, they just sort of plummeted in value to to the forty thousand dollar mark and stayed there. And if you had a nice reasonable mileage, well-maintained car that was presentable, 9-11, of any year of any sort, it was hard to get them under 40 grand. And there was a hard stop at 30. Like, they just never really went below 30 for a nice car. And I thought, okay, well, I'm buying this car for 40,000 bucks. Like, there's no way that this car could possibly cost me <laughs> any more than, like, 10 grand. And chances are, if I only put, like, five, 6,000 miles a year on it, I'll be able to, to drive this car for you know a thousand or two in depreciation a year plus maintenance boy was i wrong i mean mm-hmm. 996s went down to effectively they rewrote the rule book for 911 values right um so they went to, i i had it for three years um and i sold it for nine thousand dollars less than uh i bought it for now three hundred dollars a month you said you were gonna and you said you were going to spend no more than ten thousand dollars so you did exactly what you said you were going to do there were a couple of repairs in there and, and no to be honest i mean i think i did lose about 10 grand overall i mean the, the car didn't break it was very reliable but i didn't expect to lose that like ten thousand dollars to me is a big amount of money to lose on a car it, look spread out it's three hundred dollars a month right that's a lease it's a three-year lease on a on a honda civic will be ten thousand dollars or close to it so it really, in the grand scheme of things, wasn't wasn't a big loss, but it certainly was not what I had accounted for. Um, but then there are other cars that you know I bought at my E30. I bought for fifteen hundred dollars back in the year of the flood because it was worthless, um, and they've done well. But that's we're talking decades. Like, and if if you start to look at how much money I really have into these cars, like the Scirocco, I have that spreadsheet. I have a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet on every car. I can hit one button and it'll spit out a number. You're that thick head of hair that you have now, because you're still young, you 95-year-old child, would fall out if you knew how much money I had in the Scirocco. I think my, my E28 was worse. Um, I'm not going to divulge this publicly or privately to you, but do tell, because <laughs> you'll make me feel better. <laughs> oh, mine is public on Bring a Trailer, So because I sold that car on Bring a Trailer. Uh, to be fair, there was about $10,000 of insurance repair uh, in there, mm-hmm. but the total invoices for that car were uh, almost seventy thousand dollars. Just from you? Uh, no, the previous owner spent about eighteen thousand dollars on like new clutch and like rebuild front suspension and blah 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 between like seventy eight thousand miles and one hundred and thirty thousand miles when I bought it. So That's a lot. but that didn't... type of thing certainly I'm not a stranger to unfortunately. But what I will say uh, is that. 
I think when you were talking about the 993 versus 996, one of the things that you you bumped up against that is really important for long-term values, and so the question that like I will ask often to, to highlight this, is if you look at in 2003, an SL55 costs $150,000. You look at a Z8, it also costs $150,000. Uh, an SL55 from 2003 is currently worth $48 or so, maybe. That much? A uh, oh, Canadian dollar. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pesos. <laughs> and it's worth zero. A Z8 is worth, you know, 150 or right. 200 depending on mileage. Thousand, uh, and, not just thousand dollars. Yes, right. so yeah. it's not worth three times as much. It's worth like three thousand times as much right. as an SL55. A uh, couple of reasons why. Uh, one is that the Z8 was not replaced by anything, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the SL was. Uh, and so what I was trying to allude to with the the 993 versus 996 is that if the replacement of the car has is meaningfully different from the car it replaces in a way that collectors don't like or enthusiasts don't like, then you get a value difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would say one of the pieces of counsel that I have if you're trying to identify what might be valuable in the future is to focus on cars whose replacements either don't exist in the case of the Z8 or the replacement is meaningfully different and loses something sort of important to enthusiasts, whether that's a, it's not naturally aspirated anymore or it's not... Uh, hydraulic steering anymore, or it's not uh, it's not manual transmission anymore, or uh, maybe several of those things. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, if the replacement has some kind of divergence away from like a golden age of some sort of something that enthusiasts value, uh, then there's a good chance that it'll do well in the future. Yeah, uh, people talk often about the end of breed. This is the last one of an era, right? Yes. So. M2 right now, um, you know, I have a friend, you know who you are. This is a friend who listens to every podcast. And then I get a download of all of the things we screwed up and all of the things we did well. And his feedback is amazing. <clears throat> Mark, <clears throat> uh, you know who you are. But he's he bought an M2 and is like, I seem to think that this is going to be the last of the breed. This is the last going to be the last car that BMW makes before they completely fuck everything up forever. Um, and so he's sort of convinced himself that this M2 will hold value better than most because the one M kind of did that. So there's a little bit of historical precedent to support that conclusion. Okay. So that brings me, brings us into the next sort of, I think what we're going to do on this episode is we're going to wind up with a checklist of, of sort of things that tend to correlate highly with the car's future collectability. Mm -hmm. um, and he's right. In that and the one M of those things is rarity, which the one M has in abundance because they only built enough or the tooling was only supposed to last so long. And once they wore it out, they were like, well, we have to make new tooling to make more of these cars. So well, and there was also that. an issue of that was the the other issue. I was going to get to the rarity, the scarcity thing in a second, but there's actually another issue and that it was a Skunk Works non-fully, fully fledged, fully baked project. And if oh, you like the E30 back, wagon. Right. You look back in history and you have all these cars that just happened. In, in Germany, it always happens over summer break. So the, the managers go on vacation because they, they get a month off and a bunch of engineers work like undercover evening hours or whatever to come up with something outrageous that would never ever ever pass through the normal uh, product Channels. planning process right mm -hmm. and then when the managers come back from vacation they're like oh but uh, yeah by the way welcome back go drive that thing and that's what happened with gti for example with the original volkswagen gti which was they thought would never sell in a million years uh andy proninger who is like you know, our god and hero of Porsche GT cars has certainly pulled a bunch of those moves in his life, including 911R and Cayman GT4. Um, but things like that 1M Coupe, that was not fully baked. That was a bunch of engineers who shoved e uh, E90 competition pack uh, suspension and stuff underneath the 1 Series, flared the fenders out, sent their boss out to go drive it. He came back with a hard-on and sweating, like, oh, fuck, this is amazing. And then they made it. Um, M2 doesn't have that. So it wouldn't even matter what M2's production numbers are. It's a regular production model um, where the 1M coupe was an aberration. It was a, just a, you know, and it was also the, sort of the first time anything like that appeared. Um, is there a meaningful difference in terms of like the way the product is realized when you're using it though? Yeah, yeah. Like it's much more baked and, and mature and yeah. civilized. The 2 Series is a much better car. So the M2 is... I would, yeah, 
I would say overall, the, the M2, let's not talk about all the other two series models, but the, the M2 is a fully baked, fully realized BMW M product through and through. It handles exactly as an M product should. I think it's the right size. I think it's the right package. I think it's the right look. It's got that bulldog stance that we all love from BMWs. Um, and every, every part of that car is like manic and fun and silly. The 1M Coupe was maniacal at the limit. Um, because you were dealing with suspension des designed for the M3's naturally aspirated V8, and it had, what, 295 pound-feet of torque um, that was delivered in perfect increments with the tiniest little gas pedal motion, and then you put all of that stuff in a shorter wheelbase package um, without any Spiky other Spiky power changes, delivery. With a crazy laggy turbo car that had 35% more torque, or whatever the number was. I mean, I'm, and it would hit like a... Like, like a bag full of bricks to the back of the head. Um, and the car was a difficult thing to control. I love that about it. I, it was its personality. I mean, you turn off stability control. And the first thing everyone always did, like on the launch, was just spin it. They were like, well, what the fuck? But you learn to drive around that. And the car is just magic. And it's fun. And it's fizzy. And it does, does all the right things for an enthusiast. Not necessarily for a bean counter or a, a, you know an, an, an accountant or a, a, a lawyer working for BMW. So there's there's a fundamental difference in the two cars. To answer that question, um, but I think you're right that the next big thing is scarcity, right? I mean, so if a car company makes a hundred thousand of one thing and five of another, the one that's they make five of is going to be worth a lot more. Yeah, there's an important, important. I mean, if you want to talk about genuine collectability, there's an important threshold, which I think is a thousand cars. If they make more than a thousand of something, then it's not ever going to achieve like in, insane value. Two notable exceptions, of course, are the Gullwing and the F40. They made fourteen hundred Gullwings. They made eighteen hundred and fifty-eight Roadsters, and they made uh, twelve hundred something F40s. Those are the only seven-figure cars of which they have made more than a thousand examples. If you're looking for seven figures, if you're just... What? I see you thinking. Sorry. You, no, no, no. No, no, no. Ignore my weird face. Your our internet connection keeps going down, and you just said... For a second. And so I'm like, what is he trying to say? And you know I have no control over my face. So I should just be sitting there doing the newscaster... Okay, so anyway, uh, if you want like seven figure values, then you need to have less than a thousand examples. And you've talked about this before because you're like, oh, it's one of like, you know, 10,000 built that has the big engine in a car they built 700,000 of. Right. That's not like, that's not rarity that's that gets you to seven figures. The kind of rarity that gets you to seven figures is like of cars shaped like Lamborghini Miras or whatever the, the car is. Mm -hmm. Like if there have to be only you know, 700 or 500 of them or 300, whatever it is, uh, of those entire cars. And so, you know, that's at the, the high end of the market. You know, other stuff like 2002 TIIs are now routinely like knocking on $100,000 and BMW CSs and stuff like that. And those, so if you're saying like, oh, I care about more like trying to get to $100,000 with something that I'm buying, then, uh, then rarity is less important, although attrition becomes more important. Well, rarity, uh, so, I think is so still... rarity today, right. but uh, if something with a high attrition rate and then you find a good one, uh, then that that's important. And that uh, attrition happens with cars that, well, a okay. tend to rust, right. oh, <laughs> and, yeah. and and b like were at some point cheap used cars that young people were like, oh, I can get a great deal of performance for very few dollars. I'm going to buy this and then use it up, and there's going to be like, it, whatever's left afterwards is going to fit in a shoebox. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the, and so any car that sort of, and that's why I think it, like Mark one GTIs have gotten really expensive, uh, because they all got used up because they all fell into the hands of people who modified them or spun them or understeered them off the road or whatever they did with them. Spun them. Spun them. Yes. Mark ones have lift off oversteer. Like, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's attrition is a really big important thing, but I think so. Especially of be, quality examples. Right. We have to be clear about one thing. When you're, when you're talking about like true collectability and the seven-figure mark, I, I, think, I think there's no question about it. Rarity, the total number of cars produced minus attrition, right, uh, needs to be at a very, very small number. Um, but then the top of the sort of regular collector market, which is the you know, $100,000 or, 
old car, two hundred thousand dollar car, like to get near or just into the six figure mark, you can have a hot example of a mass produced car like sure. a GTI or <laughs> to use all my cars, a one ninety E two point three sixteen or an E thirty M three versus a regular E thirty. Um, and you can then easily knock on that hundred thousand dollar value um, for the cars that are the exception, meaning they haven't been ragged out, they haven't been modified, they haven't been abused, they don't have four hundred and fifty thousand miles on them. Um, and and then you have the factor, of course, of all the things that were ch- cheap speed. Anything that's cheap speed is gone. Right? Yes, I mean it was cheap speeded off into the s- scenery, into, <laughs> into the hedges. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, that's an interesting thing, but I think that is actually the single biggest factor in, the, in, the, in, in determining a car's future collectability is, is it desirable in the first place? Because there are certainly cars that are rare because no one wanted them then and no one will in the future. Um, mm-hmm. But even they do well. Like, if you want, you want a car that is going to do well in 50 years, Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet. I bet you anything that will outperform an M2. I mean, you're giving that look because we, for the right reason, right? Because the thing is horrid. I, but it's it, too esoteric. This is like Nash Metropolitan Territory or like, I don't know, Amphicar. Like, it's just so, such garbage <laughs> that like, I don't, I don't I see it. One. An Amphicar? No, oh, Nissan Murano. You probably have. I'm talking <laughs> Nissan Murano cross, cross cab. No to both, actually. Okay. Cross cab was interesting. It was a, it was a terrible idea, poorly executed. Um, but it had a really beautiful interior. I, okay. Whatever. They were, yeah. I, I, so I, Jason's pick of the episode is a Murano cross no, cab. No, no, no. I'm just saying I think that'll outperform. The, the, it, it was sold in such small numbers that I think it'll outperform cars that we even identify as future classics. Um, because 40 or 50 years from now, someone's going to look at that and be like, holy shit, one survived. I don't think so. I don't see it. I don't see it. Okay. Could be wrong. Personally. Could be wrong. I'm not saying it's going to outperform everything. I mean, obviously there are cars that will outperform it. But, um, you know, the thing is we also don't know what the car companies are going to do. So we don't know what the next M2 is going to do, for example. Yes. It could be a front-wheel drive shitbox. And in which case, current M2 competitions will do incredibly well. It could be BMW waking up, smelling some coffee for the first time in a very long time and saying, we have gotten this completely wrong and doing an about face and giving us exactly what we want. In which case, the current turbo cars will wind up, the current tra- crop of, you know, of, of M2s will wind up being the 996s of their respective generation. And that's exactly what happened with me and my 996, which was that the 997 came out and everything that was sucky about the 996 was fixed. The interior was suddenly beautiful again. The shifter was amazing. The engine was responsive. It just did every, it ticked every box that the 996 didn't, which then let that be the outlier, which is why its values have plummeted to zero. Yeah, I agree with that assessment. Uh, You touched earlier on something of desirability. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think intrinsic desirability is important. That's a pretty good litmus test. If something was desirable when it came out and everybody wanted one, then there's going to be enough people in X decades who are like, I wanted one of those always, or I had one and I, because, and I got one when it was new and I loved it and then I sold it for some dumb reason. Uh, so intrinsic desirability is important, uh, which is part of the reason why I objected to the Murano cross cab relay comment. Here's a, uh, here's a question about that. So I agree with you about that and obviously the intrinsic desirability but that changes over time and the example that i have there that i i i hesitate to use but it's the only one i can think of off off the cuff is a ferrari 308 gt4 so that was very not desirable back in the day um, because it was quote-unquote ugly and it was bizarre looking or whatever else Um, and as it ages i feel like it's it's popping on more and more people's radar and becoming cool because it was its design wasn't beautiful but it was so of the time um and I think certain cars have sort of limited early desirability, but then become posthumously desirable. Um, is that, are there other cars you can think of that do that? And was that predictable? Um, yes, there, I'm sure there are. I just don't have any at the ready. But I think you get this a little bit with like the Radwood movement, right? Where something was just, 
at some point you're like, wow, that is so outmoded and it is so tacky. And so uh, Countach is kind of right. Mm -hmm. They like they for a while, you're just like, ooh, that's like very gold chain and distasteful. And like, I see you can't afford a newer Lamborghini. Uh, (laughs) It's so funny to think of it that way, like a Countach. No, like that a, was the way that Countaches were when I was a kid. Like in the late '90s, it was like, really? "Ooh, those things are so antiquated and like garbage compared to the Diablo, which now we think of as being sort of antiquated and garbage." <laughs> uh, they're they're actually all kind of antiquated and garbage. But uh, uh, there's a certainly like it's cyclical where you you get. I mean, it's like fashions come back in fashion. I think for a while also like those really bright '70s colors and stuff like that on. 2002s were like, you know, ooh, that's kind of tacky and tacky in 1970s, and and then it becomes cool. So anything that's really evocative of a particular era, uh, like the old digital dashes and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Now people are like, oh, that's so cool! Look at that, like Audi Quattro or C4 Corvette. It's got like bar graphs and shit. Mm-hmm. Like in those, but at some point those were like. Oh, that's such a like retro. Well, now it's retro futuristic, but back then it was just it was like just that's retro. outmoded. It was just terrible, right? Yeah, yeah, it was just like campy. Uh, so I think that kind of stuff happens all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we're gonna feel that way about blobby era cars from two thousand two. You know, sort of bush era cars like blobby Taurus SHOs and like I don't know what what other blobby nine ninety sixes are blobby like. Is is blobbiness gonna become cool at some point? I, I mean, know, on a Lexus could. SC, yeah. I mean, okay. You know, well, you're already there, and I'm not there yet. But like, okay, there you go. That there's your. Am I actually have have I actually just been accused of being ahead of my time for the first time ever, <laughs> rather than stuck in the past? I, I think there can be certain examples, but it's gonna be the ones who are you know that are so far out there that are so outrageously blobby. But a car that was. Like the Taurus SHO is a great example because I think the first one was really cool. It was very much its own thing. Um, and Ford totally fucked up the rebirth of that. Um, Which one? The, the 96 car. Was it 96, the first year of the, the Ovoid car? So there was the... You know, was 97. The fr- there were two generations of the first Taurus. Right, but it, it was a, largely a facelift. Oh, sorry. I think we just lost each other again. There, there were two generations of the first, but it was largely a facelift, right? So it's, it kept the same Yamaha V6. Um, they, they eventually gave it an automatic, um, which was not kind of the right move. But what, you know, the, the manual stick shift cars are equal first and second generation. And then there was the blob, uh, which was the Yamaha V8 automatic only. Well, we, like miniature whale tail spoiler. Yes, the disaster. little guy. Right. Like... I don't see that ever being a classic except for in irony. Like it Which is a up- thing. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. AMC Pacer, perfect example. People yeah, like, that was like so terrible, the it's cool. G- the AMC Eagles and like mm-hmm. a lot of stuff that you would see at Concord of Lemons yeah. uh, generally. Yeah. Uh, and then, well, and at the same time, Mercury was doing the Marauder, which now I think is a concept that has aged incredibly well and is kind of cool. Uh, you mean the 90s Marauder? Oh, uh, three, I think. Okay. The, so the that, Panther platform, the rear-wheel right. drive car that looked like it was going to mar- maraud you. The problem was it didn't. The problem with that car was I know, it, it only has Impala 300 SS. horsepower. Yeah. Yeah, it only had 300 horsepower. And the, and so the Impala SS, the 94 to 96 Impala SS, I'm a huge fan of that car. That was just outrageously like perfect muscle carness. And I think, so that's, that's got it all, right? That's got scarcity. That has cool factor. It's got under the radar factor, which I always think is great. Like you know, one of those, like, if you know, you know, kind of a deal, mm-hmm. which it's I think also is, very of the is. era with all of the like color coding, like everything is color coded, mm-hmm. which is so like, you know, late eighties, early nineties tuner. There's a great ad for that car that I'm now going to have to dig up because of the way we do these inserts on YouTube. Um, which was, uh, I think it was just a picture of a black Impala SS when Lord Vader, your car has arrived Yes. Uh, or something of that sort. Like that car was just menacing. Um, but here you had a big Caprice sedan with a Corvette V8 on it. Um, and like 250, I think those tires were like 255, 40, 17s. They were like among the biggest wheels on any production car and it pulled op- i remember this pulled 0.86 uh g on a skid pad which was like genuine sports car numbers out of this enormous body on frame vessel barge. right that dated back to 1907 um it was just such a great 
like middle finger to everyone, every imported car. Those cars are fairly valueless still, aren't they? I mean, like I a great one, I think, is probably into maybe twenty thousand dollars for a great I one. In yours. I don't know. I um, in yours. But yeah, oh, that's another thing. So I think that there's very few cars that get really valuable that have four doors. Um, yeah, that's a weird thing, isn't it? Like Jag Mark IIs are cheap. Uh, I mean, I don't know. We saw BMW M5 station wagon sell for 120 grand, which is a big deal. Like there for was a five series... to a Honda Civic Si hatchback that sold for 50. <laughs> Let's not forget that one. Yeah. I thought that was a two door coupe. It was maybe it was a two door. Was it? I thought it was an anteater. Wasn't it one of the anteater cars? We might be talking about different cars. I'm thinking yeah, about okay. a blue blue Civic Si. Civic Si, yeah. Um, right. I'm and... looking at the picture. I just <laughs> clearly just looked at the like Honda Civic fifty thousand dollars. I think I made an Instagram post on it. Didn't pay attention. Um, but you're right. But there's there like, all, the golden rule in the Mercedes collector car world was by the way, don't bother wasting your money on anything with four doors, a six point three, a six point nine, whatever it is, because the the big money was Gull Wings, SLs, all of the spe- like SLS, Gull Wings, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't get that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mean, we might see a change with that. Maybe the Carlton will be that type of car that, as more people who grew up around sports cars, I think a lot of what drove previous like four door cars to not be valuable is that nobody, no, no youths lusted after them when they were kids, unless they were weird youths like me. And I think that it's now more routine for youths to lust after four door cars because there's a wider array of interesting, like desirable, like lustworthy four door cars. And so that phenomenon could change over time, especially if you end up with stuff that's kind of rare. I mean, it's happening with E28 M5s, for example. I mean, E28 M5s, great ones are six figures now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that type of stuff is happening now that there's genuinely desirable speedy. I think performance is also a really important, like, criterion for, for future collectability. Uh, and it doesn't have to be objective performance by modern standards. It just has to be like, again, that goes in hand in hand with desirability. What is what is desirable when a car is new is it has to be exceptionally like performant uh, mm-hmm. in some way or f- fun, ideally both. Or fun, right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely ideally both. Because what, what happens, the interesting thing that about cars is that fast now, any car that you drive that's insanely fast becomes normal over time. Yes. So, you know, right I now... I mean, the figures that made an M5 when it was new or a Mercedes 500e or a 6.3, like, noteworthy, are all now able to be achieved by Hyundai Sonatas with, you know, 275 horsepower. But, but even so, and I think the reason that we go down that path as a society on a macro level is that because on a personal level, if you floor, you know, some, any, you get into any car, no matter how fast it is, over time, that becomes normal. So yes, I, you get remember, acclim- acclimatized or yeah. Acclimated. Back in the day, the uh, the S54 cars, the E46 M3 came out, and my buddy bought, bought one of the really early ones, and I just remember being blown away at how fast it was. I just couldn't believe it. And he was in Germany driving it like a complete maniac at all times. Um, loved it, loved it, loved it. Three years later, I you know I went back to Germany. It was with him again, and he's still driving like a maniac. And I'm like, God, this thing is so fast. And he's like, Is it? It just kind of feels normal to me now. And I'm now I'm left with this chainsaw sound. And I don't really like that. Um, I hate the noises S54s make. They I'm sound, so, especially with it, like an exhaust that just makes the same noise but louder. And it's just like, Yeah, oh, they're not, it's not a pretty sound. No. It's, a, it's a good sound, especially the CSL Airbox. They get that great like, like crazy intake conk, that nasally uh, noise. But that, no. that part I like, but the exhaust, I mean, especially compared to like, even a US S52 with a single throttle, like those cars sound wonderful. They really it's a sound great. There's smoothness that's missing on the S52. And a melodicness, yeah. yeah. Uh, but even like an, a Euro S50 V32, so the, it's the, we're talking late E36 M3 and Z3 technically also, but it was the 321. 21. Yes. Yes, because they got over 100 horsepower per liter. It was yeah. very exciting. That is. All of the smoothness and, and music of like a traditional BMW straight six plus the anger of an S54 without any of the chainsaw stuff there. Those things are magic. Um, but, <sighs> but that was the interesting thing for him was that that speed became normal um, and then he's left with the experience. And I think the, the speed is what gets our attention as enthusiasts. Like, oh my God, this is so fast, I really want it. But the experience is what we're left with. So if the car has both speed and experience that's a really good recipe for classic because even once that speed becomes work a day for every other car on the road um if the experience is magic the experience stays magic this is what i always talk about with the 959 versus the f40 
because the 959 is so like good at putting power down and it's so like competent and it's so yeah exactly sorry I'm, that, for anyone listening to a podcast app i was just yawning uncontrollably <laughs> <clears throat> but that's the thing about that car the performance was outrageous and that made it really transcendent at the time but you drive it now and it feels like you know a contemporary turbocharged car with four-wheel drive and you compare that to an F40 where it's like all these turbo noises and like it's the, the chassis is made of Kevlar and the seats are fabric and it's beating you up and it's a dog leg and it's just like an assault on the senses. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, when, the, you know, you, the boost arrives, you accidentally change lanes and poop simultaneously. Like <laughs> it's really an experience. And that's to me why I would so much rather have an F40. And despite the fact that they made 200 and I think 72 959s, uh, they are worth, like, the, the value difference between that and an F40, despite the fact that they made literally six times as many F40s, that's very telling about the way the marketplace reacts to those There's those also, cars. there's, I think there's got to be some other factors in there. I mean, I'm, I 100% agree with you on everything you said, but also the F40 to look at is a oh my god moment that stops. You will never forget seeing an F40 on the street. A 959 looks like the ugliest body kit in 911 ever made. It's like if Mansory had made a car and it's then it not let Mansory it melt. level. Nice but then, no, no, then let it melt. So like all of the bulges and shit vents that they would throw all over it just sort of were covered up in goo. I think I think 959 is hideous. And it ac- accurately, we've discussed this before, accurately predicted the future of the the ruination of the automo- uh, automotive industry. Yes, let's make everything computer controlled and speed will be that fast and it you'll not not have to have any fun doing it. Um, but yes, all of the speed, God, none of the a, joy. Perfect. Yeah, let's wonderful. have that. The German way. Mm-hmm. I can't, uh, I can't get me started. Despite the fact that the so, in spite of that, those cars are still worth good money. I mean, it, it is a, it is as a, a historical artifact that car is incredibly important right. because it was so far ahead of its time, and it really just was the Porsche at the top of the world in terms of technical sophistication of what they could put in a road car. And they famously lost all this money on the car because it was made of composites and blah, 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 blah. So anyway, as a historical artifact, that thing is important. And as a collectible object, it's obviously important too. And that's why they're worth all this money. Uh, but, you know, that, I think that's an exceptional case because it, like I would much rather drive a Carrera RS because that car is all experience. Uh, but, you know, they made a lot more of them and they're worth less than 959s. Uh, and they're a lot cheaper to own and, and keep and all that. It's everything that a Porsche should be, whereas, you know, I don't know. So tell me about, so I haven't driven a 959. I got a ride in one, and it was amazing in terms of the speed that it generated and the Which, poo that I let out. In a, a, a 959. 959. I've mm-hmm. never driven a Carrera, the Carrera, like a RS, but I'm about to go drive a Carrera GT. Mm-hmm. Um, where does that fit on the Porsche at the top of its game sort of... Uh, artifact of importance versus actual future collectability. I'm very curious to see what you think about that. I think it's in a good spot, I think, because it is the last time that the sort of ultimate Porsche was manual transmission and it happened to be naturally aspirated and make all these incredible noises and have all this visual presence. I, for one, was never really a huge uh, CGT fan. I don't know why as a youth it just didn't appeal to me that much. I, I, it's difficult for me to explain. It's not rational because uh, it's a car that should excite me. And then I drove one and the experience was like, oh, okay, now I get the appeal. And then a lot of it, it, like a central part of the appeal is the noise. It's just that like magical 10 cylinder naturally aspirated screaming noise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that car delivers on experience, plus it also the risk of death, which is always something that like, you know, excites people uh, because those cars are famously scary to drive at the limit. I dared not drive it at the limit, especially when you like factor in the cost of we've talked about. Have we talked about this on the show or have I only like talked about this off air about the cost of getting a flat tire and a Carrera GT? I think it was off off the air, but it was an experience where you had like a client that had got a flat. Yeah, we we had we were selling one, and the client had gotten a flat in it, and he like went off the soft shoulder, and they had to replace the rocker panel and the inner fender liners, and the tire obviously, uh, and the repair for all of this was sixty eight thousand oh, uh, dollars from a flat tire. Uh, and like the windshield for that car is like eleven or fourteen thousand dollars, and like the clutch alone is also like more than ten thousand dollars just for the clutch you need to parts. Stop. You need to stop because I'm about to go drive one. <laughs> <laughs> 
freaked uh, out about this. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like a Lotus Elise, like extrapolated to its most possible expensive limit. Yeah. Speaking of which, I do have my I Hate Everyone uh, t-shirt on, by the way. And we, we do have to mention that this is like my favorite license plate of all time. And I love this t-shirt. Um, but we did hear that a couple of people who ordered the t-shirt through Spreadshirt got some funky printing errors on it. Um, and if you're one of the people that got it and Spreadshirt isn't responding and getting you another one, um, let us know. We'll do whatever we can to help. And in the meantime, I hope everyone's enjoying this. I hate everyone shirt, uh, which we now have pulled off the, the links j- just to make sure that we can get the production right before we put anything back on. So if you're looking for the t-shirt that I'm wearing, tough. Can't have one yet, but hopefully you'll be able to have one again soon. Um, yeah, otherwise anyway, you end up with a $68,000 bill to get your t-shirt repaired or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but like Lotus Elise is the same way. And this, here's the yes. way yeah, like you back classic. into you back into something and then it's like $16,000 because you have to replace the whole back half of the car. Right. It's two clamshells. It's one in the front, one in the back. And basically, other, other than the door, the entire car is, the, the entire visible section of the car is two pieces, um, which are very expensive to build and then paint and then install. But that's, I mean, that's kind of a recipe for a perfect classic. It was not replaced by anything. I mean, mm-hmm. technically there's an Elise for sale in Europe right now, so it's, but it's still the same car. Um, Both the of US these statements England. apply so far all to the Cura GT as well. Right. So it was naturally aspirated-ish. You can get a supercharger. Um, but it was all experience. It had the visual something. It was hideously expensive if you hit a shopping cart um, <laughs> or a shopping cart hit you. Um, and it, would, it delivered on the promises of its looks for an enthusiast in a way that was not contrived. Yes, very authentic. And then sold in limited numbers. Yes. Um, hmm. So that's a potential... I mean, uh, the, the, the funny thing is that vintage Lotuses are pretty cheap. Like, mm-hmm. almost universally. Like, Esprit's, like Europa, Zolans, they're all kind of... Elites are kind of expensive. But though all of those cars are like fairly inexpensive and it kind of puzzles me to some extent until you drive one or like you interact closely with one. You're like, oh, it's kind of like a hot tub with that handles really nicely. Like it's made of plastic. No, like it's, <laughs> it's a hot like, tub. <laughs> like it's got bubbles and, and, and like, you know, and very relaxing. No, it's actually relaxing. the opposite of relaxing. It's kind of an assault on uh, the, those cars are so fringe that I think like, in terms of like how pure and focused they are that it alienates too many people for it to really achieve like extremely valuable status. Um, Interesting. A vintage Lotuses. Right. Uh, I mean, cause you like the greatest Elan in the world is, I don't know, 50, 75, maybe thousand okay. dollars. Uh, and Europa's are cheap. Esprit's are cheap too. I mean, and the funny thing is you drive an Esprit like against a, Porsche Turbo or a 355 of the same year and you're like oh it's like every bit is performant and it certainly is an experience well, yet it costs half as much as, as either of those cars and but Lotus mm-hmm. has always been really good at sort of doing more performance with less cars. Is part of that is part of that the name? All right, there's another factor right I mean so basically anything with a Ferrari prancing horse on it will be worth a billion dollars that's sort of like you know. Except 308 GT4s. Why you have to do that? We're, I'm, and Mondial. I'm supposed, be, I'm supposed to be self-serving here. Let's bump the value up. No, I'm kidding. I don't care what the car's worth. I'm not selling it. But it, it I mean, historically, f- basically anything with the Ferrari badge on it, Agreed. other than things that didn't originally have the Ferrari badges on them, or things were that were so ugly, like the Mondial. Um, although that's another perfect example of a car that's a coming into its own. It really it's, is. Uh, and really I have is. I have counseled people to buy Mondials before because they are actually really good to drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people who are thinking about buying 308s and 328s, I'm like, mm, try a Mondial out. Just, you know, especially if you can get an, an 89 coupe because that's one of those things where it's a one-year-only car. It's the, the, so partway through Mondial production, they switched the engine from being transverse to longitudinal, which is, like, very invasive. Mm-hmm. Um and, like, they got lots of horsepower, like, additional horsepower. They redid the dashboard completely. And then they made it for one year in coupe form. Uh, and then in convertible form, they made it for 90, 91, 92. But 89 only was a 3.4 liter coupe. And it's like, that's kind of a car that I would consider, like, a, probably a wise thing. If you like that, if you, w- if you want a 328, I would say buy an 89 Mondial T coupe instead. Because they drive better and it's kind of... Uh, you know, it, it's a, an interesting piece of history that would make me more satisfied to own, frankly. 
especially because of how they drive compared to... So, uh, right. So we, you just stumbled on something else. Given every measure that we've discussed right now, a 308 GT4 would be far more expensive than a Ferrari 308 GTB or GTS because the GT4 was pr- produced in fewer numbers. Looks. Um, we haven't talked about well, looks yet. Right. I was gonna, And it drives. Let's, let, let's just agree. I apologize to anyone who owns a Ferrari 308 a Pininfarina car. They are miserable to drive. It is the biggest promise in the world from that absolutely Visually. stunning body. Uh, and they're the biggest letdown. And the, the GT4 is exactly the opposite, where it's just you're buying this car for the experience of driving it. And they're absolutely magic. And for um, looking at the dashboard, because the dashboard, is, the dashboard is beautiful. Cool. Well, plus, all, I mean, look, sometimes we like ugly things. People have pugs, and they're ugly little dogs, but they're the cutest things in the world because they're so ugly. And they go, they snort, and they, you know, <laughs> and they overheat if it's like over 64 degrees outside. I mean, sometimes ugly is cute, and I think, you know, that's fine, but I mean, looks. that's the whole micro car movement in a nutshell. It's yeah. something that you just can't help but laugh when you interact with it. Right. Like cute. the fact that a BMW Z is worth twenty five thousand dollars is hilarious because it's literally less competent than a golf cart. But it's so Fair like enough. Yeah, but it's adorable. It's such an experience when you interact with it, you're just like, yeah. I can't not adore this experience because it is it, it it's a hell of an experience. Right. Um, so does I mean here the next thing the next logical question is if three oh eight GT four versus GTB are hundred and eighty degrees out from from what we're saying does it just at the end of the day all come down to looks um necessary but not sufficient Ooh, god you're a nerd but that's a really good point necessary but not sufficient so if it's gorgeous it will help it's a car's chances of being desirable but that in and of itself is not enough and, and except gorgeous in the case of the izetta well, the Z has $25,000. It's not like a hugely valuable car. You uh, $25,000 for something the size of a shoe and with far less functionality, I would say, is an absurd amount of money. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> I mean, seriously. It, um, it, it's, I guess it's primarily the way the steering wheel is attached to the door. Yes, one door. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, it, it, so... It, the whole point of that car is not to be pretty. It's like micro cars are like that. I mean, they're, they're never pretty. That, that, so that it becomes like interesting instead mm-hmm. uh, is what drives like the interest of those cars. Uh, but in terms of like, it has to be good looking and, and good looking doesn't necessarily mean gorgeous because like E30 M3 is a great example of that. The aesthetics and the box flares and all of that of that car are so spot on and so evocative of that era that like that car ticks the aesthetic box necessary and so it doesn't necessarily need to be gorgeous because i don't consider the e30 m3 like beautiful i Mm -hmm. think it's really good looking but it's not like a beautiful car the way that like a ferrari 275 is or something like that um but it has the look and it the looks of that car help it for sure Mm -hmm. because you know there's some cars like you were saying with the gt4 where the looks like it's it's great in spite of the looks other cars are great because of the looks and i think the e30 m3 is the the looks sort of enhance the package rather than being like oh it's pretty good for an ugly car like right. which is kind of what, what what most people react to with the gt4 for example fair enough fair enough i so right before we did this started recording this podcast i got an uh, instagram dm from someone who's like okay uh, Aston Martin V8 Vantage 4.7 liter or Shelby GT350 R Mustang. And the, I mean, that is a comparison that I would have never made in a million years. However, they're the like, same money to buy. <laughs> oh, smoke started pouring out of my ears because I'm like, all right, that Vantage is magic. It's such a beautiful, it's easily top five most beautiful cars of the last 25 years. Like it, the four seven sounds amazing, especially with a couple mods you can do to it. The driving position is great. The steering is brilliant. The the car is just at the top of the list of modern sports cars without question. The GT 350R is by far the best driving American sports car of all time. It is got a magic engine, a magic gear shifter, a magic suspension, magic everything, shit interior, but everything else is great. And the only two issues that the the cars have in common is that they have gears that are way too long to really make them fun around town. But they're brilliant on a track, they're brilliant everywhere, and I just couldn't decide. And so my response to him was, if you're gonna track the car Mustang, because 
frankly, you're not going to want to pay Aston prices for brakes and for, you know, whatever else goes wrong with that car. And GT350R is better on track anyway, far better on track. Um, but really, does one of their long-term prospects come down to, like, I think the Aston probably has better long-term prospects in the next 10 years um, due to the Aston Martin brand and the way it looks. But then 50 years from now or 40 years from now, like GT350R is a relatively limited production car, you know, limited production American muscle cars that, that beat up on the Europeans tend to do really well in value. Um, that's a really tough question now, but I don't know what 10 years from now will, will look like at all. Yeah, that's an interesting struggle also. It's weird. It's a weird thing to cross shop. I think that, I've, I don't know, are those Astons very expensive to keep? I've the heard some horror now. stories. So the, the biggest horror story that I, can, that I can tell you is that a very good friend of mine had a 4.7 liter with 14 or 19,000 miles on it, and the engine popped. Um, rod knock. So it spun a rod um, bearing, and it was under some pretty, I don't want to say abusive, that's totally the wrong word, um, Aggressive. extreme conditions. So he was approaching red line in second gear around a long left sweeper that had a big, uh, like a, a heave, almost like a bridge. So that unweighted crossing. the car. Unweighted the car. He got a little bit of wheel spin. Um, stability was on, I believe. Um, and he hit the limiter. And I think what happened was that, you know, 7,500 RPM, sudden unloading and reloading of the engine as the wheels came off the ground and back, just put a load on the engine. Or he sucked oil for a split second. Again, it was a very long Well, yeah, if he's, if he's getting oil starvation, although that's a dry sump car. Yeah, but even, I mean, even you're talking, I mean, there's a lot of G loading in a big bump where you get air and it could have just, the, one of the pickups could have run dry for, for a split second. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Unlikely with a dry sump car. But for whatever reason, uh, he brought it to, you know, the Aston shop and they're like, this, what? This, it does happen with the V12s. The V12s have oiling deficiencies. Um, but the V8s don't. And that was a massive, massive bill um, that would have been, I'm sure, in the 30s. But Aston Martin did the right thing. They stood by their product. And I give them huge kudos for this. The car was out of warranty, um, but with very low mileage and he had just purchased it from a, an Aston Martin dealership. Um, so corporate stepped in and said, okay, look, if you pay, they split it up somehow and it cost him a couple thousand bucks, three, three, $4,000 out of pocket. They did give him a new engine. Um, and I think part of it was they wanted the old one back to find out what the hell happened um, because they need to know this yeah. stuff, right? If, if there's some weird incident. Um, that is my, that's the biggest horror story that I've heard. Otherwise, we have, we have plenty of friends in common that have, have put tens of thousands of miles on these cars and they seem to be fine yeah but like periodically stuff happens where it's like oh it needs like clutches kind of frequently and those are pretty expensive and like windshields are like oddly expensive which is true for modern cars but that's kind of something you don't experience a car right yeah i mean at the end of the day you don't have have that happen with a ford right you know windshield's not going to be four thousand dollars and brakes i mean rotors i think so a friend of mine with a vantage just did a clutch a couple years ago and the car had like twelve thousand miles on it um, and there is an upgrade that you can do with clutches that sort of solves the problem for the, for the meantime. Um, but he did rear brakes and just the parts alone, OEM rotors were like 2000 bucks or some like outrage. Um, and typically when that happens, it's because there's like, a, it's got an aluminum hat with a cast iron ring. Um, and they're sort of, it's a dual metal thing. And like AMG does that. And the rotors are like $1,200 a piece, or you can just get Brembo's that are single piece and they're like $90 a piece. Um, so there's usually a way out. And my guess is that Aston Martin, if there isn't, it's because Aston just didn't sell enough of those cars to have enough of a market for the aftermarket to step in. So that's, that's why I say, if you're going to rag on it and beat it up, just go buy the Mustang. Like those engines pop too, by the way, but at least, you know, it's a Ford. Yeah. With, for all uh, parts. and so the long term question is like, what's going to be more valuable? I don't know. Buy whichever makes you happier. That's what I usually come back to. Like within, when you're operating within those two things where you're like, oh, they both have good potential, right? Because they're rear wheel drive and they're like good looking and they sound good and they're good to drive. Like they all, they tick, you know, boxes that should both, that should contribute to both of them being collectible in the long term. So then you just buy what ma- matches to your personal utility function the best, whether it's like, I really want to look at an Aston Martin or I really want to cane it and I don't want it to be too expensive. Or like, I like the sort of American bravado, the, the sort of, you know, brute force experience or, or whatever. But like in either case, I don't think it's going to be a dumb move, but it's what it will do is that they represent some kind of end of an era of naturally aspirated eight cylinder manual 
you know, sports cars, and so it'll be a good thing to own, and you'll have a great time doing it. Uh, so just buy whichever one makes you happy. Uh, and hopefully your tastes are aligned with enough other people that they, they, they actually do become valuable, because if you're like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm super into, like, tan Camrys from 92. Like, I know there are people out there like that, but I don't think that those are going to... Uh, it's not tan, they're gold. Tan, that but then you can't call 95. it a tan cam. Uh, well, I don't. Um, and that tan, otherwise known as JRG or you know gold or champagne, uh, is one of my favorite Japanese sedans of all time. Like the 92 to 95 Camry was stunningly, elegantly beautiful. No, it is actually genuinely good looking. I'll give it that. Um, that, everyone uses that as an example. I find, I find it so offensive. Not really. But I think it's so funny that everyone uses like a 92 to 95 Camry as like the most boring thing in the world. Those cars were stunning. Stunning. Look at them today. In fact, I'm going to find inserts. I'll find one of the car that I got my, work, my first ever speeding ticket in, which was a 110 and a 55. And just look. I'm not. I'm just look at the lines of that car. Look at the simple, elegant no. simplicity of that car. It, yeah, Is there's an shocking? elegance and simplicity to the, the design of that car, which is missing from today's overwrought styling. Amen. Which, which I don't care for. And you look at, I mean, this, you see this, like Hyundai did this. And, and to their credit, I mean, it's helped them move cars because people are like, look at how emotive and exciting this is visually. And so they sold cars. And so it did what it's supposed to do. They don't care about how it's going to age. This is not the 80s with Mercedes Benz, right? I think that those Toyota, those Toyotas have exactly the, the sort of Bruno Sacco thing, which is like, look how like sort of restrained and like well proportioned. And it's like a just genuinely solid, like good design that isn't fussy and not gimmicky. Whereas now everything's gimmicky. Uh, Carmudgeon, yeah. Carmudgeon, Carmudgeon. Blah, 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 blah. But it was just, it's kind of funny. Like, I wonder if we should put the thumbnail of this episode as like a Champagne Cam. 92 Camry and say, does, is this car the perfect classic car? Right? It has, other than scarcity, because they sold 400,000 a year of these cars. Um, but they're not, they're scarce now because they've all been run into the ground. Like everyone put 300,000 miles on them and blew them up. Um, they are worthless for a long period of time, which means no one maintained them properly. But they're good to drive. Genuinely good to drive. <laughs> I'm being silly, obviously. But like, you know, if we had a recipe for a, a, the perfect, the perfect uh, classic, future classic, it certainly would not be a 90, 92 to 95 Camry. But um. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> clarifying that. We've come a long way in this episode. I, even, I was trying to make a like that... It's so absurd. I can't even finish it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So what, what do we have here? Let's try to summarize. Rarity, like intrinsic desirability, like goodness to drive, uh, some kind of aesthetic in, like experience and it either in the like sort of E30 sense where it's like, oh my God, that's badass looking or, or like, you know, purposeful or like actually genuinely gorgeous the way that like a Toyota 2000 GT is or something like that. Uh, something that perfectly pa- captures its zeitgeist. Is, yes. Is, is really the, I think that's what you're saying with the E30. Something that really doesn't need to be necessarily beautiful, but something that just is a really great representative of a different time. Yes. Um, will definitely. Yeah. I, I think, higher. and whether, whether that is just looks of the car or the whole car itself. And mm-hmm. that's where you start getting stuff where you're like, oh my God, that's so 70s. Cool. As opposed to like, oh mm-hmm. my God, that's so 70s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah, but Finn cars, for example, I mean, that's a, that's a great example. Cars, yeah. you know, if you look at cars from the 50s, those with the most outrageous fins, you know, 57. 59 that, Cadillac. Uh, 59 Cadillac, the one with the, the those are the biggest sort fins. of bullets. Yes. Yeah. The massive, massive fins. Of it. Well, if you're going to pick a car from that era that's, that's yeah, that has know, that vibe, that time, then you want gonna be the most exaggerated, right. most intense, like most unadulterated right. expression of that mm-hmm. philosophy. Right, like a Daytona, uh, like the Charger, Charger Daytona yeah. would be for yeah. that era, or even a 2316 uh, Evo 2 or 2516 Evo 2, like mm-hmm. the most outrageous DTM era car. Yeah, speaking of four-door cars that are worth six figures. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for but, seven. But, well, I'm never going to have one anyway, so it doesn't matter. Let's hope for seven figures. They're most uh, of the way there. Um, so, yeah, something that really is just the most intense expression of some philosophy. I don't know how to sort of put it more concisely than that, but anything that's just maximum X adjective, whether that mm-hmm. adjective is like, like 1980s or like DTM or NASCAR or like chrome f- and fins of, you know, whatever it is, 
uh, or muscle car, like, you know, horsepower, or whatever. So, so mm-hmm. yeah, something that really uh, typifies. Uh, the same thing is true of design also, mm-hmm. like uh, of like the work of a certain designer, whether that's, you know, the Mira or anything, uh, Fioravanti, who was a Ferrari designer who did everything all the way from the 246 Dino all the way through the uh, Testarossa, I think, was the... I think he did was, Testarossa. Was, no, was, BB. I don't, I don't know. Um, um, maybe Honda First Gen, Honda Insight. Takes all the boxes. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> You're just looking for, for cheap shit to buy. <laughs> I'm that. bored. We're still in. I mean, it's you know we're two and a half months or three and a four, seven months into coronavirus lockdown. The you know the rest of the world is sort of going back to normal, and we're like, oh, we're going into a lockdown number two. And I just want like other things to play with. Could you blame me? No, you I mean, escaped into another room without vodka bottles. I, I'm still in the same friggin' place with mm-hmm. my crystal ball, saying, "Oh, magic crystal ball, would you tell me what will be?" Come on. Given what I, you said that like while I was sleeping and then we wake up and you're like, when are we carmudgeoning? And I'm like, I don't know. And next thing I know, I have to come up with a prop and an intro and a song to sing. Is this acceptable for the best I can do? It's, it's I gorgeous. See. You should sell them. Future so, forget selling t-shirts. You should just sell them. <laughs> you think the t-shirts are bad quality? Watch this shit. Here's the automotive crystal ball. I am going to go buy a fish tank, like a goldfish bowl. And I'm going to put a model of it, and that's going to be my new coffee table thing. And I'm going to expense it <laughs> because you came up with it, and therefore it is a legitimate business expense. Okay. And now I will have then predicted this is my crystal ball of future collectible cars. Um, thank you for joining us on Carmudgeon, where we are truly based in science. <laughs> and you have to respond to that somehow. Come on, 4% QED. of the time? QED. Uh, that's like the Latin thing you say at the end of a proof, like that says that it that means it is demonstrated. Speaking of science, that's actually more for mathematical proofs. Uh, someday when you're 95, <laughs> you, know, you, you might come across it by then. All right. I look forward to the making it to 95 so I can say, I can say the letters out loud, QED, at the end of... A proof. A proof. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, until next time... Uh, please hopefully have a safe return back to your normal uh, vodka soaked kitchen thanks um, and I'm going to find somewhere else for me to record it so I don't have to feel so pathetic. You go on out. vacation to your living room I'm going to go to like the, the warehouse and just hang out with my cars and cry at them because I never get to see them anymore alright alright until next week thanks for joining us don't forget to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and more importantly click the notification bell so that you get a notification and or email every time that we post something amazing which could be Carmudgeon or it could be Spotlight or it could be Proper Care and Feeding or it could be just something totally different I don't know not in charge here it could be some faulty t-shirts Q- you're gonna have to issue a recall <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah we're gonna have to issue a recall <laughs> Takata t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> ECB puts out a press release. Yeah, ECB, a, uh, a Northern California-based uh, startup, would li- has issued a recall for 42,000 potentially faulty Lotus Elise shirts. Meanwhile, we've probably sold Which could become t-shirts. unfastened in the event of aggressive <laughs> cornering. If you put it in the, in the washing machine, it's gonna, like, the colors will disintegrate from each other. But it would be funny. It wouldn't it be cool if we could actually sell more of these t-shirts than Lotus sold Elise's? I bet we could. We might have already done so. It doesn't take much. Your car I mean, will be worth a million dollars in a matter of minutes. Right. Well, we definitely have so- sold more, more of these t-shirts, I hope, than Lotus made of the, uh, the Elise SC. It was like 266, 268, something like that. This is your car. You should know this. I don't care. <laughs>If you enjoyed the Carmudgeon Show, make sure you subscribe to the ECME YouTube channel and click that notification bell to make sure you're told every time we publish something amazing, which is basically every time we publish anything. Are we done yet?